Well, you know, we have scan them. Um, I've greeted you in the uh, language of the Onondaga Nation, which Alice so generously um, mentioned where I'm from, uh, where I was born and raised. Uh, it basically means I am grateful to see that you are all well. That's kind of a long version. It's a little bit shorter. Um, I would like to acknowledge, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, no Wadago? Noatok. Noatok. peoples of this territory for allowing us to be here and um, us. So I'd like to thank the folks from here for that privilege. Um, I'd like to give some special thanks, if you don't mind, to my very dear friend and colleague and sister, Dr. Alice Nash, for this helping to put together this, this wonderful event. Um, I'm a little prejudiced, but I'm very happy that this Truth and Reconciliation uh, series begins and starts with the First Peoples, Indigenous Peoples. So it's, uh, it's only appropriate that we, we begin the kickoff of the series. Um, and thank you very much for all your good work. Uh, I look forward to something really great. Um, Alice has been a colleague and a friend to my leadership, the Haudenosaunee. Uh, some of you know us as the Iroquois Confederacy. She, every year she works uh, with the Haudenosaunee delegation at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and helps do some amazing work for the leadership. Um, she is known and respected for her work, um, for our Native communities, um, and we care for her very dearly. So thank you, Alice. Glad, glad we're here. I'd like to also thank the History Department um, here at uh, University of Massachusetts, and also uh, a very grateful thank you to the Feinberg family for the, this distinguished lecture series for 2012. Uh, I saw the materials, it is wonderful. So congratulations on this. Um, as you know, the, the focus uh, will be on truth and reconciliation, history and justice, and it's going to be a global perspective. As you heard earlier, it will include Northern Ireland, um, and regions throughout the world. So we are opening today with a stellar panel, really stel stellar panel, and you are in for a, a great treat. They are experts in this process uh, known as truth and reconciliation in indigenous communities and with the states that surround them, whether it's Canada, the United States, um, Etc. So we're going to be looking at Australia, Canada, and the United States um, today. What, what I'd like to um, mention is that this work that we're going to be hearing today uh, comes on the heels of some apologies by nation states, uh, two in particular, Canada and Australia. Uh, they recently apologized for their historical racist policies towards hundreds of indigenous children, in particular those in boarding schools. The United States also had a very long history of boarding schools. Um, if you go to the website, um, the Boarding School Healing Project, uh, here in the United States, you'll be able to get some information on the history of boarding schools here in the U.S. Um, that particular time um, had a mandate, and the mandate was kill the Indian and save the man. That was the mandate of the schools, the religious communities that uh, ran them, and the state. Uh, and as you probably know, it only takes one to <coughs> two generations to do just that. Kill the Indian and save the man. The loss of 
language and from there flows your culture and when your language is gone everything is up, else is gone so what got sent back to the communities here in the United States um, were, were people who had been tremendously scarred but also had no parenting skills they weren't exposed to it they didn't know how to be a parent and what transpired after that was generations of folks without parenting skills and the effects and the damage that was done on the communities um, can't be overstated. So that's sort of the, the U.S. perspective. But in a, in a similar vein, what we've seen recently has been the um, repudiation, the call for repudiation and expunging of this theory of the doctrine of discovery, which we're going to be talking about this afternoon, this legal construct known as the doctrine of discovery. Um, religious denominations throughout the world have asked, have asked to have it expunged from international law, and they include the Episcopal Church. There's a reverend in Maine um, who's part of the Episcopal Church, uh, John Diefenbecker Kral, who has taken a very active role. And because of his leadership and work, we have the Episcopal Church calling for a repudiation and expunging of the doctrine of discovery. We have the World Council of Churches, the Anglican Church, the United Methodist Church, the Universalists, and I may have left out a couple of others, who are denouncing that doctrine of discovery and attached to that are the boarding school issues, which you, you are, are going to hear in, in just a little bit. So I think as far as the United States is concerned, the boarding school issue needs to be addressed directly, uniformly, and nationally. Um, it's happening in different places throughout the country, and there needs to be a coming together that we see in Australia and that we see in Canada. So there's a national voice and not just bits and pieces. Um, what I've been seeing are a few attorneys sort of coming up and going to communities saying, let's do a legal action. Um, and that may not be the only way to go for communities, and our folks need to have choices as to how they want to approach this. Um, I think what we'll do at the end of our, our speaker's presentations is we will have the floor open for questions and answers for the speakers um, so we can have an interactive dialogue, which I think would be, would be a great way to end our, our two hours together. <coughs> Um, and also to keep in mind, if you're familiar with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, you may want to ask some questions about that uh, to our speakers as they relate to the right to self-determination and free prior and, and informed consent. Right. Well, um, I am going to go by the list that we have in our program, and Greg, I'm going to call on you first, but I, uh, Greg is going to be talking about the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission in Canada, which um, he is a part of, and he's going to give us um, a legal perspective, but if um, you bear with me, um, with your permission, I'd like to introduce a little bit of Greg's background. It's quite stellar, but I'm just going to pull out some highlights so he can get, <coughs> get to work. Um, Greg Younging is Cree. He's an assistant professor of indigenous studies at the University of British Columbia at Okanagan. Did I say that right? Okanagan. Okanagan, yeah. <laughs> 
Okanagan. <laughs> He has a PhD in Educational Studies from the University of British Columbia, and I was on your territory last week mm -hmm. at um, Thompson Rivers University. Oh, very beautiful up there. Um, in 2001, Greg was appointed Assistant Director of Research to the Truth and Rec Reconciliation Commission of Canada which addresses the history, legacy, and intergenerational impacts of the residential school system on Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, there's so much more to share, but uh, I know you're anxiously waiting for Greg to make his statements. So, um, Greg, you have the floor. Thank you. And uh, I, I would also like to acknowledge the uh, Nowatog uh, traditional territory that we're on. Um, the Nolotog are actually from the same family of nations that I come from. Somewhere about between seven or eight thousand years ago, and in, in our ancestors' migratory patterns, we reached the, the, the eastern point of Lake Huron, and then the descendants of the Wolwatog continued down in this direction, and the Nwak people, who are also called the Cree people, where I come from, continued along the the northern part of the Great Lakes, and then eventually went up, up to the northern, northern part of what is now Canada. <clears throat> so it was actually 2008 when I started working with the TRC in Canada. I, I have just got a new career and a new job as, as a university professor. Um, and after only one year that, I was asked to if I would be willing to work for the TRC and eventually, and I didn't want to leave the students and the university and the Indigenous Studies Department at UBC, so uh, we eventually worked out an agreement where I worked half time as, as the TRC as Assistant Director of Research and I'm still managing a half course load in, at the university. <laughs> and I will be doing that till the TRC's mandate ends in 2014. Can you stand by the podium that way? Yeah. Can we have this? Um, sorry. Okay. In the history of, of Canada, we had, you know, we had wars between the, the British and the Indigenous people. We had wars where Indigenous nations allied with British against French. Um, <coughs> um, but for the most part, the British Crown decided to follow the teachings of international law, the teachings of gratuitous, and wrote the Royal Pro Proclamation in 1763 and acknowledged that indigenous peoples were nations and acknowledged that they had some land rights and if the British were going to get any lands in, in, in the, um, the Americas, in the, in the northern part of the Americas where they were starting to establish colonies, that they would, this lands would, that would have to be ceded to them and purchased from the indigenous nations, and there would have to be a negotiation process. And that's what set up the treaty process. Now, in Canada, the treaties um, were, were land-sharing treaties. And <coughs> now I know there's a common misperception that treaties were indigenous people signing away their lands to British people or to the Americans or whatever. <laughs> but the treaties under international law are, are international agreements between one or more nations. That's what a treaty is in international law. And so the treaties in Canada were land sharing treaties. They were saying this part of the land is kept for the indigenous nation and this part of the territory is going to be signed over to the British in exchange for treaty benefits. <coughs> so they were agreements to coexist independently of each other in, in the land territories that became Canada and they were based on international law. And most of the country is covered by the 11 land session treaties that you can see in purple here. And while this, at the same time the treaties were being signed in the 1850s to about the 1920s in Canada, at the same time the Canadian government started to develop policies and ideologies about Indigenous peoples. And I'd like to say that, you know, we were on the good track with it following international law, nation-to-nation -nation negotiated treaties, 
recognition of the continuation of indigenous institutions, indigenous rights, and coexistence. But at the same time during this period, this bad track, which I'll, I'll call it the bad track, started to develop where, where British people said that indigenous peoples were inferior primitive savages, and therefore that the land was terra nullius. There was no human beings here on the land <coughs> before Western peoples came. And then the doctrine of discovery, that, that these lands are being discovered by, by Western peoples, and that indigenous peoples need to adopt Western institutions, and that they have no rights based on their prior occupation of the territories before the arrival of other peoples, and that they need to be assimilated. This was the official policy that was eventually adopted when Canada became a, a colony of Britain in, in 1867, what we call in Canada confederation. Um, but the residential school system even began before that confederation. The first one was actually set up in Brantford, Ontario in 1831. So after having these, this nation-to-nation -nation relationship, when, when Canada becomes a British colony in 1867 through the British North America, America Act, it unilaterally declares that the Queen has responsibility for Indians and lands reserved for Indians without any consultation, without the indigenous nations agreeing to this, and of course in breach of international law. And at soon after Confederation, the government uh, starts to write the Indian Act and also high, um, commissions Nicholas Davin to study what to do about the education of indigenous children. And Davin actually comes down to Carlisle Indian Residential School in Pennsylvania and studies what they're doing there with the beginning of the boarding school process in the United States and takes those ideas back to Canada and he says this is what we should do in Canada. The children <laughs> should be separated from their families and we can as assimilate them in, in these schools and he says that the churches are eager to assimilate and Christianize these children, so the, church, the churches are willing to work in conjunction with the government to set up this residential schooling system around the country. And then the Indian Act is written in 1867, another unilateral act based on the authority of Section 9124 of the BNA Act, setting up the reserve system and basically governing every aspect of indigenous people's lives on reserve. And there's no shortage of these statements from that you can find in the history books or in the archives uh, of what in, in, uh, Canadian politicians said about embarking on this assimilation, assimilation process. This is just one, one of the early ministers of uh, Indian Affairs said, the improvement and elevation of the Indian race socially, morally engages the earnest attention of the government the legal status of the Indians of Canada is that of minors. So the Indian Act declared that Indi uh, all indigenous peoples, even if they were adults, were technically children and wards, wards of the state. Section 74 of the Act, which still exists, sets up the band council system. So it says how indi indigenous peoples have to govern themselves and elect their leadership on their reserves says you have to, the chief has to be elected <coughs> and the number of councillors have to be elected so it ignores and delegitimizes our tr traditional governmental institutions and will not recognize the traditional governmental institutions. In section 114 which was written in 1884 was the beginning of the culture, what we call the culture ban period. Uh, initially the first section 114 in 1884 said the indigenous ceremony practiced by the Quag youth people and the Simshan people and the Haida people, known as the potlatch, which is, a, which is the center of all their social and governmental and spiritual institutions. It said the potlatch is illegal, and if anyone practices the pot, is caught practicing the potlatch, they will be imprisoned for a term not exceeding six months and not less than two months. And lots of people were imprisoned for practicing the potlatch. <coughs> and later on, this. Uh, this section 114 is amended to say not only the potlatch, but the, the sun dance, 
and all other Indian dances and festivals and Indian traditional dress is, out, is outlawed under this section. So I'm just trying to show you that here that the various laws and legislations that go along with the assimilation policy and the residential school system that are being put into play here all at the same time during this period <coughs> to try to fast track this assimilation of indigenous peoples so that, the, so that the reserves could be abolished and that the entire territory in, of Canada and all the resources on it could be turned over to, to the control of the Canadian government. <coughs> section 119 of the Indian Act was the school, the section that gave Department of Indian Affairs, and by the way, it was the Department of Indian Affairs, this, the counterpart to the Bureau of Indian Affairs in, here in this country, that was charged and still is charged with the task of overseeing and running the Indian Act. <coughs> but Section 119 of the of the Indian Act <coughs> was written in at the beginning of the residential school system, giving these DIA, Trudent Officers, as it calls them, the authority to go into any in indigenous household where, where they thought that children were in the household and not going to these residential schools and make sure that these kids get to these schools. And if there was any resistance from the, the families to having the children taken, the, as you can see at the bottom, the Trudent Officer under not, one, Section 119.6 is given the authority to use as much as force as circumstances require. And this is just what the Prime Minister said in 1987, the first Prime Minister of Canada. The great aim of our legislation is to do away with the tribal system and assimilate the Indian people in all respects as speedily as they are fit for the change. So, As I said, there's no shortage of these statements and if you go through the archives and, and read the parliamentary inserts. There, there's, there's hundreds of them. Um, the Bryce reports, 1907. This was the chief medical inspector, Peter Bryce, who was commissioned to, to study the health conditions in the schools uh, due to the number of deaths that were occurring in the schools. Some of the schools had up to a 45% death rate. Many of the children, most of those were attributable to diseases which indigenous peoples didn't have immunities too, like TB and, and smallpox. But he, Bryce reported in 2007 and 2008 that the number of deaths in these schools was appalling and it was putting the government, what does he say, in unpleasant nearness to the, the charge of manslaughter. Mm -hmm. uh, but these charges were, were ignored. Nothing, nothing was done in response to the, the, the studies. In 1920, the Indian Act makes attendance at these residential schools mandatory. So the, the goal was 100% of indigenous children would be taken away from their families and put in these schools. And by the way, there's, these schools were usually very far away from their, from their indigenous communities. So that, and that was an, an intentional part of the, the policy to, to separate the children from their families, even geographically geographically as much as possible so the influence of the family would not not be in their lives and they, their only influence would be the, the teachings and the curriculum that, that they were getting in the residential schools. Another one of these statements, I, I won't read them all. That one was by Duncan Campbell Scott who was the Minister of Indian Affairs at that time in 1920. 1927, the Indian Act illegalizes land claims, any sort. It says that in, if more than six indigenous peoples gather together to discuss a claim, that this sh shall be declared illegal. And if any lawyer is hired in such a cause, the, the lawyer <coughs> will also, also be punished and, and <coughs> imprisoned. And they, they, say, they say claim. They don't even want to use the word land. They just say a claim. In this, in this section of the Indian Act. So the, this was basically the era of the residential schools. Between the mid-1860s up until the 1990s, depending on the part, the part of the country you, you come from, there were uh, over 300 of this, these schools in every region of the country, in every province and territory. <coughs> and um, 
The system started to wind down in parts of the country in the 70s, but it wasn't until 1996 till the last school closed. And these are some of the, you know, you know the, the things that happened in these schools, beginning with child abduction, child indo cultural indoctrination, punishment for language and culture, um, massive physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, deaths and murders, and over that period, about 5,000 uh, in indigenous children attended the schools in this system. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at the TRC is called the Missing Children Project, where we're trying to determine ex as much, in as much as possible how many deaths there were during that time period. And just to let you know, there's about 100,000 living survivors today. Uh, I, by the way, am, am a second generation survivor of residential schools, meaning that uh, I'm the first generation in my family not to go to these schools, but I am impacted by the intergenerational effects which were just referred, some of which were just referred to, to earlier. <coughs> so the generation of my parents and aunts and uncles and the five or six generations before that did go through this system. I'm the first generation not to in my family. So Roe and Chris John has done a pretty efficient job of documenting the types of ab abuses that uh, occurred in these schools in his book, The Circle Game, um, Sh Shadows and, and Substance in the Indian Residential School System. He dedicates uh, about four pages to listing all the types of abuses that occurred. And th these are just fr from Chris John's book. <coughs> and this is actually a li an non-extensive list. And this is actually the light version, I would say. Uh, I could show you um, a chapter in a report th of, of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation which tries to document all the types of ab abuse that occurred to the children. And it's, there's many examples in that chapter that are much worse than what you're seeing on the screen here. We're finding, like, for example, that among the women, this rate of sexual abuse was, is almost half. And if you put sexual and physical abuse together, it's around 70%. And it's a, a bit lower than that for men. Um, so just you can imagine the impacts on a population of people when, when abuse rates are that high over the, across the entire population. And uh, <coughs> so how does this become? A, cur a, a current issue today. <coughs> you see, I was talking about the, sy the system winding, starting to wind down in the 70s in most parts of the country. The last school closes in 1996. Even before the last school closes, some of the churches start to apologize, the first being the United Church. And we start to get apologies from the different churches who were, were working in conjunction with the federal government on these on these schools. A very significant event occurs between 92 and 96 when the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People is held across the country. This commission travels to every region of the country and any Indigenous person is invited to come and testify before the commission and say whatever they want about what they want to tell the commission. And hundreds, actually thousands of residential school survivors come out for the first time come out of the closet because there's a lot of silence associated with this. I can tell you that coming from one of the families that my parents, my aunts and uncles di didn't tell me anything about what happened to them in residential schools and terrible things. Some of those things that were just on the, the previous slide happened to my family members, but they didn't tell me anything. My mom is just starting to tell me some things like just last year she started telling me things. So there's a silence that occurs and that silence was broken um, for many people during the hearings of the Royal Commission when thousands of them told about what, told the country what happened to them in residential schools. So it was out of the closet. Um, and then survivors started suing the federal government for what happened. And then survivors started getting together <coughs> in class action lawsuits to the point that we had hundreds of class action lawsuits 
against the federal government from residential school survivors. More apologies in the 90s from the di different churches. We have the Aboriginal Healing Foundation formed as an arm's length organization funded by the government to, to deal with the healing of the survivors in 98. And then just more and more class action lawsuits in the early 2000s to the point that it was a severe economic threat to the government of Canada. When there's 100,000 living survivors who could potentially su each sue the federal government for a life ruined due to sexual and psychological and physical abuse and, and the other things that happened to them in residential schools. So the government responded. Uh, in 2005, the federal government of Canada appointed the former Supreme Court judge Frank Akubici to lead a dispute resolution process. And there were three parties, and there are three parties to this process. One is the Assembly of First Nations on behalf of the survivors, and that's our na the Indigenous National Political Organization in Canada. Two, the churches, and three, the Government of Canada. So under the, <coughs> under the auspices of Frank Akubici, these three parties go through a negotiation process and Akubichi comes out in 2005 and says he is declaring that, there's, that there, these, there is going to be an Indian res a residential settlement agreement. And what the agreement entails is a compensation package for survivors that has two parts to it. One is the Common Experience Payment, CEP, where every survivor who can prove that they went to residential school gets a $10,000 payment and $3,000 for every year that they can prove that they were in residential school. And then an independent assessment review, that's the second part of the, pa the compensation package in which survivors who were abused psychologically or physically or sexually can testify before a, a committee of the Department of Indian Affairs and they have a formula to make a judgment of how much compensation they get based on how badly they were abused. So it's, it's, these are the two compensation packages which are actually just coming to an end right now. Uh, the period in which survivors could apply for these is, is coming to an end. The government underestimates that there's approximately 86,000 people that were, uh, are eligible for the competition. There's well over 100,000 that applied during the period. The other thing that Justice Akubichi says, it's part of the res Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, is that Canada must embark on a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to expose the truth about what happened in these schools. And that process began in June 2007. And as mentioned, we had the Prime Minister, Ke the Pr Kevin Rebb, the new Prime Minister of Australia at the time, making an apology uh, for what happened in Australia to the children and the stolen generations. And then the Prime Minister of Canada is, is pressured to, to, make, to make an apology to Canada and sp specifically to the, the Indian re residential school survivors, which he does in July of 2008. This is just the oh, top of the front page of the Indian residential school settlement agreement. And you can see the parties to the agreement listed there. So what is the mandate of the TRC? The mandate was strictly written down by Justice Akubichi in Schedule N of the settlement agreement. And, we, and this, I'm just going to review some of the highlights of, of the, ma the mandate. So it's to acknowledge the residential school experience and its impacts, to pro provide a safe setting for survivors and their families and communities, to tell their stories of what happened to them, to facilitate truth and reconciliation events across the country. So the mandate is a five-year mandate, by, by the way. Um, to provide a report and provide recommendations to the government of Canada. So we have just in last March of 2012 released the m interim report, reporting on the work done to date, and the historical report in which we we wrote the true history of the, of the residential schools. Uh, and we 
That was one of the first two reports. And the, the final and third report is going to be the final report in 2014, including recommendations to the Government of Canada. There's a mandate to do commemorations, so different uh, statues or exhibits that will be uh, placed ar around the country, some of them on the former sites of, of, of the residential schools. Uh, an awareness and public education campaign. Um, it's probably, I think, from what I know, it's pretty similar in the United States that the general a very low percentage of the general population knows about what happened to children in these schools. And in Canada, I'm f I find, just by my experience and observation, about 95% of people have n in Canada have no idea what happened or even that the, this, this, this school system existed in the country. So we do. <coughs> and that, just even with throughout the mandate of the TRC thus far, that's beginning, slowly beginning to change. So to create a historical record, we already did the release the historical <coughs> report, as I said. <coughs> Statement taking. Um, the commission is authorized to, to and, in, and actually told through the mandate that they should take statements from as many residential school survivors as possible. So this statement taking is ongoing. There's over between four and 5,000 statements that have been taken thus far. And the survivors have a few different options how they can make their statement. They can do it anonymous, anonymously over the phone or mail, write it out and mail it in <coughs> on paper. Or they can come to some of the TRC events where statement takers are there. And even they have even options at those TRC events, they can either be filmed, taking their giving their statement, just be audio recorded giving their statement, or they can give their statement in the public truth-telling sessions that occur at the TRC events, which are also filmed and documented. Now it says, part, I think part of the title on this, my, my presentation was the legal mandate. Well, I, I would say we don't have, really have that much of a legal mandate. Um, it's, and so there's some parts of the mandate that state specifically there shall be no subpoena powers there, there shall be no this is not a public inquiry and not a formal legal process so there's no pr um, subpoenaing or, or prosecuting that can occur uh, in the commission and it goes on t to stress these points um, that the commission the commissioners shall perform their duties without making any findings regarding the misconduct of any person, and that in the in the in the hearings and the truth-telling sessions, they shall not name names of anybody. And uh, we have had examples where um, survivors have made their statements in public and named the people who who have um, committed uh, crimes against them as children. And those things are being struck off, supposedly supposed to be struck off the TRC record if they name people. And we, by, by the way, you can go on the TRC website and see some of these testimonies that are being collected. They're on, they're on the website. And uh, I was at an event in Victoria where a man did a, <coughs> ama um, an amazing stor story of his childhood. It was actually, maybe I shouldn't say amazing, it was terrible. But it's one of the most powerful uh, truth tellings I've heard uh, so far. And he did name his perpetrator. And then I went on the website to try to look at it, and I wanted to show my students, and it wasn't there because he, because he named his perpetrator, I guess. And it, it, it goes against these, these limitations uh, in in schedule and in the schedule and mandate. Ah, access to information. Canada and churches will provide all relevant documents. We're having a major problem with this because they're not. And we even suspect some documents have been destroyed intentionally before we can get there and try to get them. <coughs> and, that's a and that's a major issue right now with our work. Uh, another important part of our mandate is the only legacy that will be left behind by the TRC uh, is the, a national research center which will be established. And all of these tr truth-telling documentations, these testimonies from survivors will be included in, in this national research center as well as our, our, um, our research mandate. We commissioned many 
research papers, but about 28 uh, studies have been commissioned by the research team that I'm part of on different aspects of the residential schools. And then, of course, the events. There's national, regional, community events that take place uh, th throughout this five years, and we're about halfway through that, those events right now. I think I'm doing okay for time. So um, right now I'd like mm -hmm. to say that I'm, I'm going to pose a bunch of hypothetical questions about reconciliation, and I would like to say I'm stepping out of my TRC role here. These, are not, these do not come from my work at the TRC, but maybe I'll, I can, I'll say I'm, I'm saying, giving you these questions as, as an Indigenous Studies professor or as a second generation survivor or just as an Indigenous person from Canada who's concerned about reconciliation in the country. <coughs> and I think they're very useful in helping us. By the way, the TRC, uh, there was one discourse we were having within the TR TRC about the about whether to call the, the IRS era genocide or not. We noted that in the Bringing Them Home report in Australia, they did make the accusation of, of genocide, and we have been considering should we do that. Uh, and we've, I had actually been arguing for it uh, and wondering how, what the outcome would be. And then all of a sudden, uh, just about a year ago, the Justice Murray Sinclair, the chair of the TRC, made a speech at the University of Mar Manitoba and declared that it was genocide and it was all over the headlines of the newspapers. <coughs> the Canadian government responded the next day <laughs> saying that it wasn't. Uh, but now uh, what we're doing is putting together the argument of what is reconciliation after genocide and going about the task of proving that it was genocide uh, you know, under Article 2E of the UN Genocide Convention in our, in our final report. So here are some hypothetical <coughs> questions that I think could guide our thinking around genocide and probably apply in this country uh, in a lot of ways as well. What w so what would it be like today if Indigenous people had not forcibly, were not forcibly assimilated and had their language and spiritual beliefs and governments not been denigrated by state genocidal practices. So just try to imagine what, what would it be like today if these things transpired differently. What would it be like if indigenous communities, families and nations had remained intact and been able to accom accommodate some Western institutions on their own terms and reject others? What would it be like if indigenous people were able, able to retain <coughs> strong communities and nations and develop modern civil society institutions? What would it be like if indigenous people's <coughs> relationship and respect for the environment was debated on equal footing against, against Western industrial models of resource exploitation and accumulation of wealth? What would it be like if indigenous political, legal, and spiritual institutions <coughs> were able to have an equitable discourse without prejudice against their Western counterparts? What would the state of the environment and the human, condition, the human condition be today if indigenous peoples had not been subjected to intense Western colonizing, genocidal, and, and imperialistic measures over the past two centuries? What would it be like if the treaties were honored and indigenous, indigenous nations were treated as subjects of international law? Oh, I just skipped over the last slide, but it said, what would it be like if indigenous children, if all indigenous children had been able to reach their full human potential? Mm -hmm. And then the final question on that last slide was, where do we go from here? And I just wanted to end with a really brief film clip of an incident that happened in Canada in 1990, which impacts our reconciliation path, where uh, the Mohawk Warrior Society were trying to protect their, sake, their ancient grave site from the expansion of a golf course and th they came out with their guns to protect the territory and they had a, gu a gun fight with the Quebec police uh, which ended with a Quebec police officer down and, and, and he didn't make it. Um, we're still not sure where that shot came from but uh, anyway the, the warriors were surrounded. Go ahead and play it. Please. 
This is Ellen Gabriel. She's the spokesperson for the Mohawk warriors. Eventually, the army is pulled in to replace the police, the Canadian Army. We have a thousand SQ officers waiting to come in, but we will not surrender. We've done nothing wrong. We're not criminals. They try to intimidate us and break our spirit, create division amongst our people. And once that bridge was open, uh, it's fairly evident they could do what they like now. And they're doing it. And this is what they call peaceful resolution. So this is a point where the army is, Canadian army is moving in on the Mohawk warriors, trying to, to the surround them. This is a warrior in the camouflage. So they're having to back up, the warriors are having to back up because the army is moving in on them with their tanks. So this is the Canadian army moving in on the warrior blockade. And this is, and the women are telling the warriors to get back because they don't want to back up. Meanwhile, on the 344, Bones Pin, an unarmed warrior in a golf cart, defies the army. While Mad Jab heals from set to five. <laughs> so this is the Canadian Army. So you can see how tense it got. So that's the Canadian Army. Okay, that, that's all I want to show you. I just wanted to show you how tense it got in 1990. And actually, that this conflict is what led to the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that I mentioned. It was a major international embarrassment for Canada. And the last thing I wanted to say was that you know, in, this, in Canada, we're trying to go through a reconciliation process and work our way through these things that have happened in the past. And you know, it's a very similar history in, in the United States, the boarding schools, the American Indian movement, occupations. And uh, I really hope that uh, something happens in this country around these issues because they're, they're so very similar to the issues in Canada. Thank you. We're going to hold questions and just keep uh, going and have all our speakers so you can hear from all the speakers. Yes, well, um, I think we're all appreciative of Greg's amazing uh, presentation and how well he walked us through um, the legal history of First Nations peoples and the Canadian government. And I think you begin to see the similarities between the United States and Canada. The United States sort of serving as the foundation of, of these movements such as boarding schools that then went to Australia and New Zealand. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Christine Parker. Christine is an Aboriginal from New South Wales, Australia. So we have a, uh, a, another international visitor with us today. She has more than 20 years experience in journalism and communications. She's the, she has been the editor of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander newspaper, the Cory Mall. And um, she, is, she has been the director of National Aboriginal Cultural Institute, uh, Tenen, Tenden, yeah, Tenenda, in Adelaide, an institute that I visited several years ago and, and very, very beautiful. She was also the media advisor to the uh, federal minister for Aboriginal 
uh, and Torres Strait Islander affairs. And she has many awards and acknowledgments for her wonderful work. What she is currently doing is she is a member of the Board of Reconciliation Australia, a national orga organization promoting reconciliation between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the broader Australian community. Um, I would like to introduce to you our very special guest, Christy Parker. You have the floor. I'm just recording everything and it'll be this massive file of about five hours unless <laughs> I kind of pause it and start again. So I'm just going to do that and start again. And um, sorry, I might just um, put that there. I need this. That. Get my glasses. Um, I. Uh, um, would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and the custodians of the land that we are gathered on, the um, Noatag people and surrounding tribes. Very well, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm acknowledging the traditional owners of this place, the Noatag people and surrounding tribes. Um, this is a protocol that is um, widely practiced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. Um, it means we are saying to the custodians of a place that we see you, we recognise you, um, we appreciate your connection to your land and we respect you and your ancestors. And also that we appreciate um, you allowing us to be on your country. Um, I also wanted to say thanks to UMass um, for the invitation to be a part of this lecture series, uh, especially my very close friend, Professor Anderson or Jane, um, and also Professor Alice Nash and the History Faculty. I've been to um, the States before. I've been to New York for a couple of shopping trips. <laughs> <laughs> and last year I went to Portland, Oregon to attend the National Congress of American Indians and it was a great honour to be a part of that. Um, but I have, obviously, I've never been to Massachusetts. I'm very happy to be here. I also acknowledge the Feinberg family um, for whom this lecture series is named. I thank Greg, Greg for his presentation. Um, as I was listening to him, I was going to say in my presentation, you know, there may be some similarities and parallels. In fact, there are many. Um, and I think that'll become apparent as I talk. Um, so thank you to Greg. And I also want to acknowledge another visitor from Australia who's here with me today. He's also a very close friend of mine. That's Craig Green, who's sitting just there. Um, <laughs> Craig. <laughs> Happens to be uh, happened to be in New York at the same time as me, so I said, come up and um, hopefully be a part of this. And um, he's a Gurindji Walpi man from Central Australia, and he works for the National Congress of Australia's First People, which is our new representative <coughs> body. And I know that he won't mind if I encourage you to talk to him as well um, for the very valuable perspectives that he can bring. Um, can people hear me now? Am I articulating a bit better? Sorry, it's probably the tone of my voice as well. I feel a bit husky. Um, and also, I want to say thank you to each of you for coming today as well. It's very exciting to be here. And I also recognise that there'll be varying levels of awareness in the room about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the first Australians. Um, for the benefit of you um, um, who don't know much, I'll do some scene setting. Um, I'll refer to my notes, but there'll be some parts where I just talk off the cuff as well. Um, and I also really want to welcome questions um, at the end. Um, it would be impossible to cover the full gamut of issues impacting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I feel um, it would be impossible to do justice to um, my people in a lecture like this, but I'll do my absolute best. Um, as uh, Tanya said, I'm here in two different capacities, um, which I believe complement each other. They're unrelated, but I think they fit quite well. The first, um, um, as has been said, I'm the managing editor of the Koori Mail, which is the national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander newspaper in Australia. It is the longest running 
and the only wholly Aboriginal-owned national newspaper in the country. We've been going for about 21 years. Um, some of you might be interested to take a look at some of the copies of the Koori Mail that I've jammed into my luggage. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also got a couple of copies of a uh, newsletter that's put out by Reconciliation Australia and also a publication. Um, Greg referred to, um, and other people have, to the apology that was given in Australia in February 2008. That's a publication that the Koori Mail published to commemorate that um, very important event. So first in, best dressed, I'm apologising apologizing to the sound guy because I keep kicking this table. I hope it's not blasting your ears out. Um, and um, I'm also um, here as a director of Reconciliation Australia, which is the national organisation promoting reconciliation between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and other Australians. Our vision as an organisation is an Australia that recognises and respects the special place, culture, rights, and contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and where good relationships between the first Australians and other Australians become the foundation for local strength and success and the enhancement of our, of our national well-being. I also stand here through my mother's lineage as a Uwalawai Aboriginal person from northern New South Wales. Um, New South Wales is Australia's most populous state. Um, it has the biggest population generally, but also the biggest Indigenous population. It's also um, the area which bore the brunt of the first wave of invasion. I'm the product of a biracial union. I'm one of four children, two girls and two boys born to an Aboriginal mother and an English dad. Um, my dad moved to Australia as a young man. He was about 20. Um, he was a Londoner and he was intent, he tells me, on becoming a cowboy. Um, despite never having <laughs> ridden a horse, um, he scored a job as a stockman on a uh, pastoral property in Australia. We call them stations, um, which happened to be on the traditional country of my mum. Um, my mum, on the other hand, was a very accomplished horsewoman. Um, her dad, my grandfather, worked on the station um, as a station hand to provide for he and my grandmother's growing family who lived in a shack away from the big house. Um, my mum died in 1996 at the age of 53. She was the oldest of 18 children. Um, and when I think about, that means that my nan was pregnant for, I think, 14 years of her life. Um, I think that's a big achievement. Um, crazy, perhaps, but a big achievement. Um, but 10 of those 18 children are now in the grave. Nine of them didn't make it to the age of 50. Um, my mum started her working life at the age of 11 as a domestic servant, um, which um, many Aboriginal people consider domestic servants to have been effectively slaves. They were people who worked without pay in many instances. Um, um, and in that role, mum cooked and cleaned and did the bidding of the um, non-Aboriginal family that owned the station on her traditional country. She went to school on and off for only about 18 months, um, leaving out a necessity to look after the 17 brothers and sisters that came after her, or helping her mum to do that. But she did go on to teach herself to read. Um, she did that from a couple of books that she spirited up in the roof of their shack to keep it out of the hands of um, uh, her brothers and sisters. And I remember her telling me that Lucy Maud Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables was one of her favourites, which um, I can't imagine would have been, could have been any further from my mum's experience, but it was a favourite. Um, mum went on to become a Jillaroo, a cook, a taxi driver, an Aboriginal liaison officer for a local politician, and a university arts degree student. Both my mum and dad cared a lot about education, and they instilled that in me and my brothers and sisters. Uh, sister. We all finished high school, and as far as I know, my sister and my older brother were the first people um, on my mother's side of the family ever to go to university. Um, today my sister is a health policy specialist, she's a writer, she's just won a really fantastic big literary award in um, Australia for Aboriginal writers, I'm very proud of her. My big brother is a surveyor, my little brother's a jack of all trades, he's made fishing nets, he's framed pictures, done arts administration and photography and more recently because the money's very, very good, he's doing road work. Um, and I'm very proud of them all. And then there's me. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I've been a journalist for 25 years, predominantly in print, but also in radio and I say corporate, but really government television. So probably sounds glamorous, but it certainly wasn't. It was, a, it was the public servant. Um, I'm the manager, managing editor of the Koori Mail. And when I say Koori, it's spelled K-O-O-R-I. Um, 
Koori is a word to describe Aboriginal people from New South Wales and also from Victoria to the south. It's not a language group, it's more of a regional grouping that describes people from those areas. And similarly, um, the word Murray is often used to describe Aboriginal people from Queensland. The word Nunga is described, uh, describes Aboriginal people from South Australia too. Um, now, I'm just going to show a couple of photos as we speak and common to them, um, this is just this is the board of the Koori Mail. As I mentioned, we're wholly Aboriginal owned. They're all Bundjalung Aboriginal people. Um, they represent five community co-ops that own our newspaper. Um, I'll just go forward. That's the Board of Reconciliation Australia. Um, I'm wearing the same flower, I'm ashamed to say. Um, <laughs> I'll quickly pass that. Um, now, a lot of these photos um, have common to them the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags. The previous one with the red, black and yellow was the Aboriginal flag. This is the Torres Strait Islander flag. And um, they were both designed by Indigenous Australians. Um, they, on the Aboriginal flag, um, the black represents the Aboriginal people. The red represents the earth and the red ochre and the spiritual connection that we have to our land. And the sun represents the sun, the giver of life. On the Torres Strait Islander flag, the um, green represents the islands of the Torres Strait, which are just off the um, far northernmost point of Queensland. The blue is the sea, uh, the black is for the people, the um, white shape in the middle is a dari, or it's a headdress, which speaks about the culture of the Torres Strait. And the five-pointed um, star refers to the five regions of the Torres Strait. Um, in 1995, for better or worse, these flags were proclaimed official flags of Australia under the Australian Flags Act. And when I say for better or for worse, I'm particularly talking about the attitude of um, um, the fella who designed the Aboriginal flag, a guy called T Harold Thomas, who was actually really upset that the flag was proclaimed because he said it took it from being a flag of protest um, and was just something else that was appropriated by the colonisers. Um, it does mean, however, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags are flown outside of local government offices, um, they're flown particularly on significant Aboriginal dates, etc. Um, but I feel that the man who invented or designed the flag perhaps should have had more say in what was done with that flag. Um, and I'm referring to these flags because they're never far from the front line of any Aboriginal community event. And they say that we're a very proud people. Um, we are the first Australians. We enjoy a very special status. We've always known who we are and where we come from and we fly those flags to tell people that. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people too. Can I um, just get a kind of a gauge of anyone who feels that they do know a bit about our history so I know where to kind of pull up? Couple, okay, no worries. Well, um, I won't go on too much, but basically Australia has um, eight states and territories. Um, the national capital is Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, but we are, the state and territory boundaries have no bearing on, obviously those boundaries came later. Um, what defined us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was our, were our language groups. We knew where our country was. And so when we look at a map of Australia, we don't necessarily see the states and territories. We see the 250 or so language groups that you know, were spread across the country. We're a very diverse people in terms of our languages, our cultural practices and our traditions. Um, and also our contemporary circumstances. We are extremely diverse. Um, that doesn't stop people stereotyping. Um, I'm talking about just um, general members of society, but particularly the Australian media. Um, I have a problem with the way that they stereotype our people, um, and I think that it has quite serious ramifications for us. Um, Aboriginal people are mostly from the mainland of Australia, and Torres Strait Islander people are from, um, as I say, the northernmost tip of Queensland. Um, Prior to 1788, um, when uh, James Cook surged into New South Wales, um, there were an estimated 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. Now there are only, I think, about 140 that are spoken, and only 20 of them are considered strong. And obviously, I, mean, I can't state enough the, um, what role language has in maintaining your culture. So there is a real push in Australia at the moment in terms of the revitalisation um, of our languages. There's a sense of desperation because we have lost so many of them. Um, but I'm really happy to say that the government's just conducted an inquiry into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. Um, actually, the, it was a stand, House of Representatives Standing Committee and they have made some recommendations that we hope will make a difference to the survival of our languages. 
Um, now, a total of 548,370 people identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander during the most recent Australian census, which was conducted in um, 2011 by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. 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 Sorry. Um, contrary to what a lot of people may believe, most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't live in remote desert regions of the continent. They live in cities and towns, um, many of them on Australia's eastern seaboard. Of the states and territories, New South Wales has the largest um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, followed by Queensland, um, then Western Australia, the Northern Territory, Victoria, South Australia, the ACT and Tasmania. Um, our population is relatively young. Our median age is 20 years compared to 37 years for um, other Australians. And just 3% of our people are aged over 65 years um, compared to 13% of other Australians in that age bracket. Um, also, our population is increasing very rapidly. I think it rose by 20% um, from the 2006 census to the 2011 census. And that's explained by a um, difference in, in the way that people were counted. Um, but also a higher birth rate amongst our people and also um, particularly post the 2008 apology, um, increased pride, people identifying as being Aboriginal, Aboriginal and, Torres and or Torres Strait Islander where perhaps they mightn't have before. Um, in some arenas, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people pack, um, pack a lot of punch. Through various land regimes, I'm talking about native title that I'll talk about a bit later, various state and territory land rights acts, um, we hold title, although um, really exclusively to 20% um, of the Australian landmass. Uh, the High Court of Australia's 1992 Mabo decision, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, is arguably the most important legal judgment ever made in relation to land in Australia. Eight Aboriginal people have been named Australian of the Year, um, starting with boxer Lionel Rose in 1968, um, tennis player Yvonne Goolagong Corley, some of you may have heard of her in 1971, land rights campaigner um, Galaroy Unipingu in 1978, um, our first Aboriginal parliamentarian Neville Bonner in 1979, former nurse and ATSIC chairwoman Loa Jo O'Donoghue in 1984, educator and musician Mandawar Unipingu from Yothu Yindi fame, if any of you heard of him, um, in 1992, athlete Cathy Freeman, um, I'm hoping that some of you have heard of her, she ran around with the flags after a fantastic run at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, um, and then in 2009, um, rights campaigner and then co-chair of Reconciliation Australia, Professor Mick Dodson, was also named Australian of the Year. Um, our imagery and our iconography is used to sell Australia overseas. It's what sets, um, in the eyes of many people overseas, Australia apart as a unique destination. Something like 85 to 95 per cent of international visitors to Australia say that they want to experience an Aboriginal experience. They want to know more about our culture. Um, I believe that the domestic market um, has only 0.5% of Australians um, in any given year um, seeking an Aboriginal cultural experience in the holidays that they take. Um, we also loom large on the sporting field, court and track. For example, we might make up 2.5% of the overall population, but our fellows made up 11% of the Australian Football League lists last year. We're very good at football, both codes, AFL and NRL. Um, and of course, um, who could forget Cathy Freeman's um, wonderful performance in 2000. And also, if you whip out a $50 note in Australia, you will see an image of an Aboriginal man called David Unipin, who is um, an acclaimed Aboriginal inventor and writer. Um, so all of those sorts of things mean that in some arenas, we have a high profile. Um, now, I just want to talk a little bit about the efforts being made in Australia towards reconciliation um, to advance our maturity as a nation. It's not an easy quest. Um, no national treaty or compact was signed um, with Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people. And ours is a history stained by um, violence, racism, indifference and arrogance. Um, the conversations that we have had to date and that we still have to have are very difficult. Um, a glaring example of that, I think, is how modern Australia struggles to describe um, the arrival of non-Indigenous people on its shores. Most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people regard this as an invasion. Um, many other non-Indigenous Australians will talk about colonisation and the um, even friendlier settlement. Um, in a nation of around 21 and a half million people, um, about half a million Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, uh, their interests um, can often be dismissed, ignored, 
sidelined or politicised. And that's when times are good. When times are bad, we've got global financial crises, people are doing it tough, <coughs> wars, um, uh, natural disasters, these things, uh, the situation gets worse. I think it's fair to say, and this is the same, I believe, of there's, there is no point to reconciliation without honesty, and I believe that's the experience of Indigenous people around the world. Um, part of that in Australia is accepting that we are a country of contradictions and contrasts. And I think that these contradictions and contrasts represent one of the biggest challenges facing our country, but also the, um, one of the best opportunities that we have to actually turn ourselves into a nation that we can be proud of. Um, also key is having an understanding and awareness of um, our history. And um, the 2008 National Apology to Aboriginal people, particularly members of the Stolen Generations, which I believe it's fair to say is our version of perhaps the dormitory generation. Um, we had a lot of people coming out saying, um, why wasn't I told about this? I never knew. Um, if I'd known, I would have done something about it. So people were saying, and certainly people of my generation, I'm 44, um, people of my generation were saying, I wasn't told. I consider myself a fairly young person, but so many people said I'd never heard anything about this um, because it wasn't taught um, to Australian children. Um, and that situation is only now being righted as a consequence of um, the National Inquiry into the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their families and um, also by the National Apology. Um, the formal reconciliation process, and I'm a part of that because I'm a Director of Reconciliation Australia, began in Australia in 1991, but the informal reconciliation process began much earlier than that. Um, in 1967, after 10 years of campaigning, a referendum was held to change the Australian Constitution. The referendum saw more than 90% of eligible Australians vote yes. Um, to count Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the national census of the population, this basically means that we weren't counted as Australian citizens. We were considered um, the equivalent of flora and fauna until 1967. I was born in 1967. If I'd been born um, you know, a year earlier, I wouldn't have been born as an Australian citizen. Um, they also voted to give the Commonwealth Government power to make specific laws for Indigenous people. And this was the most successful referendum campaign in Australia, um, remains so today, and it depended on hundreds of people campaigning, good white people standing alongside black Australians and doing um, remarkable things together. We had um, you know, people coming from really surprising walks of life. We had people like Lady Jessie Street, who was a very moneyed um, society matron who perhaps you wouldn't think that Aboriginal rights would be at the forefront of her consciousness, but she sat around kitchen tables with our women to devise the campaign that needed to be run, and with their help, and obviously lots of other people and thousands of supporters, um, we got that up. And the 1967 referendum is often referred to as the first stage of the reconciliation movement in Australia. Um, the 1991 report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, and I'm talking here about um, an inquiry that was held into 100 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deaths in custody over a 10-year period, um, um, and it looked into the circumstances of each of those 100 deaths. But that Royal Commission marked the start of the formal reconciliation process. The Royal Commission recommended that all political parties um, and leaders recognise that reconciliation between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians must be achieved if community division, discord and injustice to Indigenous Australians were to be avoided. Um, soon after, the Commonwealth Parliament voted to establish the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which consisted of 25 Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people um, from all walks of society. And their main task was to improve the relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the wider Australian public. Um, the Council was given a 10-year life, so it started in 1991, um, and uh, that 10-year life ended on the 31st of December 2000, which was also... Um, uh, um, uh, the year that the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation handed its final report to the government. Some of you may have a recollection also of the Sydney Harbour Bridge walk. It was when uh, I think a quarter of a million Australians walked over the Sydney Harbour Bridge in support of reconciliation. It was a very important step in our community. And the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation at that stage um, developed some documents of reconciliation. Um, they sought to achieve recognition and respect for our unique, unique place in Australia. They wanted a national document of reconciliation developed and they wanted acknowledgement within the Constitution of Australia. Um, at the end of 2000 they handed their final report um, 
uh, and it talked about this unfinished business that Australia had between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. It included a recommendation that the government initiate a process to unite Australians by way of a formal agreement or a treaty. Um, Indigenous calls for a treaty process um, you know, have re-emerged re and basically they've been around since 2000 and well before that and they've continued. Um, however, um, the federal government took two years to respond to the recommendations. It rejected most of the council's recommendations, um, including those that set out processes for formally advancing the reconciliation process. And even before the release of the government's response, Prime Minister John Howard flatly rejected the idea of even discussing the merits of a treaty process. Um, he branded that initiative inappropriate and divisive. Um, in January 2001, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which I'm a director of, was replaced with, recon uh, sorry, the Council was replaced with Reconciliation Australia, which I'm a director of. Um, now, when the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, I'll just backtrack a little here, was um, formed, many Aboriginal people um, questioned what Aboriginal people had to reconcile about. And they argued that it was non-Indigenous people who had to reconcile their attitudes, that Aboriginal people were in fact very reconciled to non-Indigenous people. It was unavoidable. They're 2% of the population or 2.5%. Um, in fact, we knew an awful lot about non-Indigenous people, but they didn't know that, that much about us. And we thought that that was where the shift had to come. I do have some sympathy for that view, but I also believe that there's no single strand to reconciliation. I don't think it's an easy or a straightforward process. I, can't, I don't think you can have one party in the equation and not the other. To me, reconciliation is everyone's business. Um, now, the Reconciliation Australia Board has 11 people on it, five Aboriginal people, one Torres Strait Islander person and five non-Indigenous Australians. And together, um, we're determined to do what we can to help build a reconciled nation. We do that in a number of specific ways. If I get a chance, I'll um, elaborate on them. But we um, have, uh, we promote reconciliation around the country. We've um, developed a program program called Reconciliation Action Plans and I think 300 of these plans have been signed by businesses, universities, schools and other community organised and community organisations around the country where all of these parties say this is what I am going to do to step up to help advance reconciliation. We've got some of Australia's biggest companies for example, they might have 4,000 staff or 10,000 staff, they are all agreeing to do particular things like they'll set employment targets for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they may um, run cultural awareness sessions for their staff, they run activities, they invite Aboriginal people in. Um, each of these reconciliation action plans is very different, um, but they are starting to, um, I guess, ensure that the rubber hits the road um, in terms of reconciliation. Um, we also run the Aboriginal, um, the Indigenous Governance Awards in Australia, so we basically reward we showcase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations that are doing good things in terms of governance. Um, there are lots of stereotypes about Aboriginal people. One of the main, one, main ones is that um, they're basically an uncontrolled rabble. They can't run their affairs and they need non-Indigenous people to come over the top and do these things for them. So we're saying, no, this is, these are examples of people who are doing these things very well. Um, as I say, I'll, I'll perhaps talk about those sorts of things um, in my question, in the questions, but um, I just wanted to say that there's a um, big movement in Australia at the moment and it kind of revolves around a lot of the work of Reconciliation Australia. We say you can't reconcile the nation until Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander disadvantage is addressed. Um, and uh, there's a campaign in Australia called Close the Gap. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it basically kicked off as a community-driven campaign in 2006 where um, it was identified that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people lived, um, I think at that stage it was believed to be on average 17 years um, less than uh, not other Australians. I think that's now been revised to something like 11 years, but it's still considerably less for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women. Um, and um, that campaign's been really successful. It's community driven, but governments have gotten on board. All governments have committed to closing the gaps, not just in life expectancy, but health. And you know, we've got some pretty terrible statistics. We have you know, we um, have much higher rates of heart, of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory disorders, ear problems, eye disorders, and some cancers, for example. Babies of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mothers are twice as likely to die at birth or during the early postnatal phase. 27% of our people live in overcrowded position, uh, um, conditions compared to 6% of the rest of the population. Um, while we make up only 2.3% of the total population, um, 10% of Australia's homeless people are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. 
Um, we have uh, much lower rates of educational participation and retention and outcomes. Um, our unemployment rate is something like three times um, the national average. I think it's about 5%. Ours is 15%. And even then, that's probably quite deceptive. We think it's much more. Um, suicide um, happens in our communities at a much higher rate um, uh, than in the rest of the population. We account for, I think, about 10% of Australians undergoing alcohol and drug treatment. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women um, experience domestic violence at far higher rates than non-Indigenous women. Um, and also we make up, and this, is a, um, this has been ticking along, I mentioned the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. The situation has gotten worse since the Royal Commission 20 years ago. Um, I think we were once 11 times more likely than other Australians to be incarcerated. That figure is now up around 14 or 15 times the rate. Um, we make up 2.5% of the population, but we make up 25% of um, the prison population in Australia. Um, I think Aboriginal juveniles are 28 times more likely to be locked up than non-Indigenous juveniles. So this is a story that must be told and responded to if reconciliation is to be achieved in Australia. Um, now, I know I'm kind of running out of time. I wanted to talk about some milestones, but I might... Um, I mean, uh, actually, I'm just going to quickly race through them. I'm not going to talk in detail about them. But, um, and some of these um, I've kind of referred to as well, but um, our kind of, I guess, our modern political consciousness began in 1938 when some of our leaders held a day of mourning. They were protesting at 150 years of oppression. Um, and that was when people really started to get organised and to agitate. Um, in 1966, we had... Um, what's considered the first kind of um, uh, land rights case. We had the Wave Hill walk-off, and Craig, as I mentioned, is a Gurindji man. This was the Gurindji people of the Northern Territory walking off pastoral poverty, saying, we are no longer going to work um, for no money, uh, or we're not going to work for tobacco and flour and tea, or what have you, and we want our land back. Um, in 1967, we had the referendum that I referred to. It was in the early 70s that we started to see the rise of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community-controlled organisations like health services and legal services. Um, in 1972, we saw the establishment of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra and the beginning of our modern sovereignty movement. Um, in 1975, the passage of the Federal Racial Discrimination Act. In 1989, um, we saw the establishment of what we referred to as our Black Parliament, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. In 1991, we had the Royal Commission. Um, in 1992, we had what's called the Mabo Decision, and this is basically um, the decision that turned... Um, uh, Greg, you referred to the legal doctrine of terra nullius, basically that you know a place is an empty land until others came there. And that was the case in Australia. That was considered to be the case until the Marbo judgment in 1992, which found that a man called Eddie Marbo, who'd fought for 10 years in his court case, um, that he actually held native title rights to his land in the Torres Strait. He actually died a year before the decision, oh, I think about six months before the decision was handed down. It was really tragic. Um, but his legacy is absolutely massive, and we've just celebrated the 20th anniversary of it. Um, uh, about 18 months later, the Federal Parliament passed the Native Title Act after a really vitriolic campaign where we had um, miners and pastoralists and other interests saying the sky is going to fall in, everyone's backyards are in danger, um, you know, Native Title is a really dangerous thing for Australia. In fact, um, you know, clearly the sky hasn't fallen in. In fact, I guess the people who benefit least from it have been Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people because um, there's a lot of, I guess, debate about whether, you know, any benefits are actually flowing to our communities from it. Um, in 2005, ATSIC was abolished, so that was our representative body. We lost a national voice. Um, in 2006, and I don't know if you've heard anything about this, but the federal government um, <coughs> was res responding to a um, report on Aboriginal child abuse in the Northern Territory. Um, it instigated the Northern Territory Emergency uh, Response or Northern Territory Intervention, which meant that the federal government came into Northern Territory communities I think there were about 80 of them, declared them prescribed communities and said, you are no longer going to have any control over um, how you run your affairs. Um, we are going to income manage every Aboriginal person who receives any sort of welfare payment, whether it was the dole, um, you know, a veterans pension or any of these things, irrespective of whether your children are going to school. We don't think you can manage it. We're going to income manage you. Um, put in place a lot of other arrangements. They compulsor compulsorily acquired those Aboriginal communities for five years and said it's for the best while we kind of handle how we're going to respond to these things. Um, and it's been really, really controversial in Australia because that um, process began in 2006. It concluded 
earlier this year and um, a couple of months ago the uh, Parliament voted to extend it for another 10 years. Um, in order to do that, the federal uh, government suspended the Racial Discrimination Act in Australia and if you need to suspend a protection for people, you know that something is wrong, it's only because um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their supporters agitated um, and the government responded by saying, yeah, we think it was you know, a bit of a bad look to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act. We are going to um, extend practices like income management um, of people that are receiving welfare now to white Australians, so it's not being racist. So instead of demonising Aboriginal <coughs> and Torres Strait Islander people, we will demonise every person on welfare in the country. Um, uh, the uh, United Na Nations Declaration on um, the Rights of Indigenous People was passed in 2007. Um, Australia was one of, I think, four nations, including America and Canada and perhaps New Zealand, that did not endorse it at that time. Uh, we did that belatedly in 2009. In 2010, we saw the National Congress established. That's where Craig works. It's our new representative body. Um, and in 2011, we saw the beginning of a campaign for a new referendum, and this was a promise of the current Labor government that before the next election, they would hold a, a um, referendum to have Aboriginal people formally recognised in the Constitution of Australia. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around what shape that recognition should take. Some people say uh, Aboriginal people should be mentioned in the preamble as the first Australians and that's about where we need to go. Um, there's also what's referred to as the race power. I talked about the 1967 referendum which made it possible for the federal government to make laws just for Aboriginal people. Um, I think at the time people <coughs> thought that they might use that law to make um, uh, laws for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it's been argued that the Northern Territory intervention is a very clear example where they used it um, to the detriment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, there's a lot of discussion around the removal of what's called the race power in the Constitution. Um, and there's also talk about if you remove that race power, lots of kind of legislation is then vulnerable. The Native Title Act, for example, which relates just to Aboriginal people. So they're talking about putting something back into the Constitution to make sure that, again, the sky doesn't fall in. Um, and as I mentioned, we um, saw the Northern Territory intervention extended just a couple of months ago for another 10 years. And also, a couple of weeks ago, the government announced that they would not be proceeding with a referendum to recognise Aboriginal people in the Constitution before the next election, because they said, such is the level of awareness about this whole campaign that we don't think it will get up. Um, I have to say that the campaign um, and support for it has been um, very strong. It's been a bipartisan kind of process. The government appointed an expert panel which had politicians of ev um, representing every party um, and independents in the minor parties. Um, people were in general agreement, but they kind of differed on a couple of points. Um, it's considered that I think only 30% of Australians even know that there's any talk about changing the constitution. And in, to get a successful referendum, you have to have a majority of people in a majority of states and territories voting for something to actually get it up. So the government has said, we're not going to proceed with it. We're going to pass an act of recognition in the parliament. Um, while a lot of Aboriginal people, including the National Congress, have said, we kind of understand there's no point going ahead until it's successful. We believe that that means that we probably won't get it up at any time. So that's kind of a quick summary of what's been happening in Australia. I'm probably run out of time. I've got a little video, but I'm not going to show it until perhaps at the end, if anyone wants to watch it. We made it, um, it's a montage that we made for our 500th edition last mm -hmm. year and also our 20th anniversary at the Koori Mail. Um, and um, it's actually really great. It'll make you feel, it makes me feel very proud. I was watching it with Craig last night and I got mm -hmm. teary again. So perhaps at the end, it? um, it's it? 10 minutes. So About I'm happy to do it again. Okay. Yep. Let's make sure we have time to get through. No worries. So I just yeah. want to say thanks. I'm sorry I talked so fast, but I had so much kind of crammed into what I needed to say, and I welcome questions at the end. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation and the, the foundation of information that you gave us about the uh, history of the Australian government and Aboriginal people. Um, it, it really clarified some things for me and um, I think brought us right up to contemporary times of what is going on legally, politically, culturally within, with Indigenous peoples. So, Christy, thank you very much. Our next speaker
Um, Esther is a citizen of the Pasmaquoddy people. She's the mother of four. She holds an MSW from the University of Maine, and she has been with the Muskie School of Public Service at the University of Southern Maine for nine years. Um, she is a lead staff person for the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission process. And for seven years prior, she worked for the Penobscot Nation Department of Human Services. Um, we are very fortunate to have someone of the area from the region here to share with us um, her perceptions and what she has to say about reconciliation and indigenous peoples and governments. So Esther, you have the floor. Good morning. Um, I too want to recognize the indigenous territory that we are on here um, <clears throat> and also for folks to think about how you benefit from the destruction of those indigenous people that called this their land. Um, um, Beskamo Gadi, um from the Passamaquoddy tribe in Maine, and I live at uh, Bonawabskewi, Penobscot Nation, with my children. Um, I have a rather lengthy presentation that I'm going to try to get through really quickly, so I'm going to, you'll see me flipping back and forth and trying to to get through it in time because I only have a okay this is uh, the state of Maine um, our what is called the state of Maine now where Wabanaki territory is and this is what Wabanaki territory looks like now um, <coughs> the community that I am from is in yellow it, that where I live now Indian Island that's the Bunawabskewi the place of the white rocks and where I was born is way at it's Pleasant Point, it's way on down east. That's Beskamukari, uh, the people who spear Pollock. Um, this, the, what you see is what represents all of our tribal lands that we have now. Those are trust lands, fee lands, and reservation lands. Um, <clears throat> like all other indigenous nations in this country, in North America, the United States and Canada, we were targeted for destruction. Um, there were once over 20 tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Now there are only four in five communities. There's the Passamaquoddy. We have two communities in Zibayag and one in Madokniguk, the Penobscot Nation. And then up north, we have the Aroostook Band of Micmacs and the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. Many of our, our territories extend beyond that border that we don't recognize into Canada. I'm just going to go real, this is the, a slide that shows Pope Nicholas V and um, <clears throat> talks about the doctrine of discovery, which Doug mentioned already, and it <clears throat> some excerpts from that doctrine. So what this really did was expound the idea that Christians were sanctioned by God to take non-Christian land and assert total control of the indigenous inhabitants of those lands. This uh, Spencer Phipps proclamation in 1755 um, <clears throat> put a bounty on Penobscot scalps, pr live prisoners, and bodies. Um, this was in, uh, put out by, <clears throat> before Maine was a state, by the governor of Massachusetts. And the bounties are as such. They had, there were different uh, prices for men, women, and children. And this actually, this bounty was issued six years after it was outlawed for Penobscot people to carry guns. So it was totally an act of war and an act of genocide. This, this, this is just one of many bounties that were put on Wabanaki and indigenous people's uh, heads and bodies. And you, have, you know that there's a team in the capital called the Redskins. Well, that has origins in, in this practice because when when a, a soldier would come to turn in their scalps, the clerk would say, how many redskins do you have? And he would say, you know, this is how many I have. It was easier to, to transport a scalp than it was to transport a whole body. So that's why they accepted scalps. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Uh, this, this is a, pictures from, this is a Navajo man 
before, uh, when he arrived at Carlisle Indian Industrial School, and then the next day after he was, um, had his hair changed, his dress changed. This is a, another photo from Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Uh, this school operated from 1870 to 1918. Um, it was founded by Henry Richard Pratt. He was a military man. The, these are the names of the Penobscot people and uh, Abenaki and Passamaquoddy people that went to Carlisle. Um, if you go onto the Carlisle website, you can, you can ask for the list of names by tribes. You can request them, but uh, what you'll see on the website is the numbers. And there's a category for unidentified, and there's 1,800 um, Native uh, children that were unidentified. Uh, probably the most famous Penobscot, I think it was on the slide before, was Louis Sokolexis, who was a, uh, a uh, th there was two Sokolexises. One was a runner, and one was uh, a baseball player for the what they call now the Cleveland Indians. So Henry Richard Pratt was a military man, and he believed in immersing natives into uh, white culture, and when you get them under there, um, keeping them under until they are thoroughly soaked. So there were over 10,000 Native children that attended Carlisle, and over 1,000 of them died while there, many of, many of them in the winter months, um, many of them while trying to escape. <clears throat> this is a picture of the Shubanagati School in uh, Nova Scotia, which operated from 1922 to 1968. Many, um, many Wabanaki people attended that school. Um, <clears throat> Isabella Knockwood is a scholar that wrote a book called Out of the Depths, and she, she's an Indian residential school survivor, and she interviewed her, um, her, her, her other students that went to the school with her. And she wrote this book. And what's interesting about her interviews is the first time she went around and talked to people and asked them to share their experiences, none of them said anything about sexual abuse. It wasn't until she went back and talked to them the second time. Because the silence around sexual abuse and, and the trauma of that sexual abuse that has been passed down is, is, is so great. Um, even today, uh, as Greg had talked about, you know, it, silence is, is, the, is the norm. We don't talk about it. Um, I know I'm doing this real quick, but I have so many slides. <laughs> um, so in the United States, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Child Welfare League of America, probably the most prominent recognized child, child welfare agency in this country, got together um, to do an experiment. They set out to prove that Native children were better off raised in white homes. So from 1958 to 1967, starting in the New England states, they strategically took 395 children from their homes. Not their abusive, neglectful homes, but from their safe, loving, nurturing homes to be adopted by white families. The majority, I, I don't know if the majority, but many of these people have never found their families, have never returned to our communities, don't know who they are, know, grew up knowing they were different, but don't, don't really know where they belong and who they were. After 10 years, they, they decided that they didn't prove what they wanted to. Um, and, but following on the heels of this 10-year experiment was the Adoption Resource Exchange of North America, which in, uh, started in 68, and it took an additional 255 children um, from their homes. Not under the auspices of an experiment, um, but under uh, another organization. Shea Bilchik, the director of CWLA in 2001, uh, if you want to see the full text of his apology, it's on their website. It's, it's a really wonderful um, address that he gave. And he apologized for what uh, their role in this project. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has offered a general apology for mistreatment of Native people, but they did not mention this project specifically. <clears throat> In 1978, um, Native people from all over the country, and actually folks from all over the world, participated in the longest walk in 1978. And the activism um, of these folks really led Congress to, to look at serious violations of, um, of Native and Indigenous rights. And in 1978, they, they passed the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Because until 1978, 
it was illegal for Native people to practice their Native spirituality, um, similar to, to events in Canada that Doug mentioned. Um, <clears throat> also in 1978, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act. And this codified higher standards of protection for Indian children involved in state child welfare systems. Um, <clears throat> in 1995, Maine State Legislature voted that the provisions of the Indian Child Welfare Act would govern Maine's Indian Child Welfare procedures. And we believe Maine is the only state that has ever done that. Despite passage of ICWA, Maine continued to have one of the highest rates of removal of Indian children. In <coughs> the 1990s, actually, um, <coughs> Maine were, um, were, they were removing Native children and placing them in foster and adoptive homes at a rate, um, I think it's, uh, my, I'm bad with numbers, about 19, 19 times higher than other states. In the late 1990s, 16% of all Maliseet children were in state care. And their chief, who's the chief now, Brenda Commander, um, isn't that a great name for a chief, Brenda mm -hmm. Commander? She, she stopped this taken. The, the police had shown up on, in her community to take a child in her and some other elders and grandmothers went there and they stopped them physically. And she said, you're not taking our children anymore. And her activism and, and that, that stand that she took really led to a historic agreement between the Maliseets and the state of Maine. Um, they, came, they passed a tribal state agreement that gave Maliseets maximum participation in child welfare cases and really recognizes um, state child welfare workers and tribal child welfare workers as co-case managers in cases of Maliseet children. <laughs> what we know about Native children that disproportionately represented in the state child welfare system, they have more placements when they're there, they stay there longer, and they have disparate outcomes. Many Native children um, leave care without a plan for permanency. They call that aging out of the foster care system. And this is just a, a slide of Happy Penobscot children, that's my son in the middle and his two friends. <laughs> um, in 1999, uh, the, the state of Maine, all the states in the union received money from the federal government to administer their child welfare programs. And in 1999, they're all evaluated on how they do. The state of Maine had received low scores on their compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. So the state decided they knew they had to do something about it because they would lose funding if they didn't. And I, I also believe that they, they wanted to comply with ICWA. Um, so they reached out to the tribal child welfare staff in all of our communities. And we got together on one November day in 1999. And I was working for Penobscot Nation at the time. And to say that there was tension in the room would be an understatement. The state had the what was happening with Maliseet children was on the radar. We had been, um, there was a lot of talk, we had been talking about racism a little bit. Um, so that was getting people, their, their, their feathers ruffled. And so we're sitting in this room and none of the tribes had ever worked together either. So we had, you know, all, all of these dynamics happening. And we stayed around that table and we stayed and worked together because we all really believed in um, promoting best child welfare practice for Wabanaki children and families. And what we did was we developed a training um, for state case workers and we implemented that training to over 500 workers in five areas of the state in May of 2000. And we, we really wanted to talk to them about Wabanaki history. Many, most people, non-native people in Maine don't even realize that there are Indians in Maine. Um, you know, we, we have, I've met people who don't think there are any Indians east of the Mississippi. So clearly we had to educate them on history. We really wanted to appeal um, and talk about why the Indian Child Welfare Act was necessary. So that we felt if they, if they were more invested in it and they internalized it, they would be more apt to follow it. Instead of just having this law, this is what you need to do. Folks don't need, not, like to be told what to do, right? Um, <clears throat> so we worked together with the state and developed this training. We also impacted the pre-service training. All caseworkers have to go through six works, weeks of training before they can work. Um, and we started to impact that. It used to be, they used to get the Indian Child Welfare Act law, oops, and then um, 
that's it. Now, um, Native people go in and we present on the Indian Child Welfare Act for two hours. So they get to meet us, they get to see our faces, they get to know, I mean, Maine's a big state geographically, but we're really a small state. You know, they talk about six degrees of separation in Maine, that's probably like three. Everybody <laughs> knows everybody. So it, it's, um, it's kind of a, it, it's a unique situation that, that we have been able to have an impact on ICWA compliance. Um, despite all of this work, we were having, building a very good relationship with the, uh, the, between the tribes and the state. The tribes themselves were developing a relationship with each other. Uh, the tribal caseworkers would still talk about this invisible wall. That's how they would describe it. You know, we only get so far in these cases and then we hit something and we don't know what it is. Um, they would talk about differences in values, in core values. Um, <coughs> tribal child welfare workers would say, you know, the, these children, these aren't cases, these are our family, this is our people. We are child welfare workers because this is survival. When, when uh, Greg had posted that question, what would it be like, I was thinking, I don't know what my life would be like <laughs> because I, my whole life has been fighting for rights for indigenous people. And interestingly enough, my mother is always um, letting me know that there is no word for rights in our language. We did not have that concept of rights. We had responsibilities and everybody fulfilled their responsibilities so there was no need to talk about rights. So her and I have some really good discussions <laughs> around that. Um, <coughs> so we, we grappled with this invisible wall and, and all this work we've been doing and, and this relationship we've been building and how we can make, take it a step further. And we heard about Truth and Reconciliation, we heard about what was happening in Canada. Um, I see on the program we have folks from Greensboro, North Carolina coming here. Definitely come and see them. We've been, they've been so helpful to us in our process and set up this TRC. Um, we have great relationships with them. You won't, you won't be disappointed if you come and hear uh, Reverend Nelson and Joyce Johnson. Um, so we, this is the convening group. We started, uh, we met with the state, um, upper level administrators in the child welfare system, folks from the attorney general's office, and we said, you know, what, what do you think about a truth and reconciliation? What do you think about going back and talking about what happened and really getting the truth out there in an effort to be able to move forward? Um, it's sort of like, like a wound, right? You, you got a wound and you cover it up and it's kind of healed, but it's, it's, it did, you got a scar there, so you got to go back and just open it back up and get all the gunk out so it can heal properly. That, that was our thinking. Um, so the state, the state was really open to it. They also recognized that there was a lot of work the Native people had to do on our own before we could engage with the state on that level. So we went off on our own and, and we, we spent hours talking and sharing our own stories about how forced um, removal and forced assimilation of our people has impacted us. We had folks on the convening group that did not even remember that they were in foster care until we were sitting around the table and talking about it. So, so um, we're not, you know, we're not talking about, we're not so far removed from it. This is happening. This has happened to us, the folks around the table. So we, we sketched out the, the, one of the first things that we learned that you do when you're established in the TRC is you create a declaration of intent. So we wrote a six page declaration of intent and it, was, it took us eight months. We were, it was the most wonderful experience. It was validating to put all these things down on paper, these truths that we knew happened to our people. And so in February of 2010, we were ready to bring the uh, folks from the state in, into the process. And they sat at the table and we gave them our declaration of intent and we we're like, and they could have, it was a very critical meeting because they could have done what happens so often in tribal state relations in Maine. They could have said, okay, you know, they could have placated us because they don't want to appear racist, right? And they don't want to make us angry, but they didn't. They pushed back because they were committed to the process as we were. And they said, you know, we can't live with some of this stuff here. So we, at that moment, we decided that the process we went through to write that declaration of intent was far more valuable than the actual product. So we decided to write it together. It was a truly collaborative process. We were gonna live up to that and we were gonna honor that. So we started over and we wrote a one-page declaration of intent. Well, 
you'll see on the second page that's after the attorney's got a hold of it. So it was one page. Um, and on May 24th, 2011, um, all the Wabanaki chiefs and Governor LePage, Tea Party governor, signed the Declaration of Intent. And I'll tell you, when we started this process, we thought it was going to be agency to agency agreement. And somebody had the idea, why don't we bring it up between the tribes and the state, you know, government to government. And uh, we had a, Republic, um, a Democratic governor at the time who was not a real friend to Native people. And we had a hard time engaging him. And then when LePage won the election, we were really worried. <laughs> um, but I, I was telling um, Alice this morning, so many things have happened along this process that just really have increased my faith in that we are doing the right thing. LePage was 11, 12 years old. He was homeless on the streets. So he had to take care of himself. He had to fend for himself. He spent some time with Malice's people doing migrant work. He went to college. His roommate was a Penobscot man. So not only did he have the relationship with Native people and he understood Native people, he also understood what it was like to be taken, um, to not be in your home. And during his speech um, on this day, the, uh, this past year, they signed the mandate. He signed the mandate for the. He um, he talked about how he was ta he was homeless and he was living on the streets, but he got to stay in his own community with people that he knew in a language that he spoke because he's a French Acadian. That's it. He said Native people didn't have that opportunity, so it's it's really um, a wonderful process and that and the timing of the elections and everything has been in our favor thus far. So the mandate signing on this year, June 29th, um, it's very historic because this is the first official truth commission in the United States that deals with Native child welfare issues. It is the first one in the world that we know of that has been developed between both sides, people on both sides, the perpetrators and the victims collaborating together. Um, it hasn't been easy. <laughs> I don't want to gloss that over. It's been very difficult. We've had to have conversations about racism about white privilege, about oppression. Um, I remember the first meeting when we said the when we said the word white, when we and the white people were like, "What do you mean? I'm not white," you know. And it's it's just it's been um, it's been an amazing process all the way around. Um, the three purposes of the Truth Commission: to document what happened, give Wabanaki people and actually all Maine people an opportunity to heal. We, we are, uh, have a concerted effort to reach out to those caseworkers who are part of that system that took Native children from their homes who were doing the best that they knew that they were doing at the time. Um, and there will be a report, an executive summary that includes recommendations for best child welfare practice. Um, <coughs> I want to talk a little bit, uh, Dr. Rebecca Sockpiece, and she's a Penobscot tribal citizen and she's on faculty at the University of Alberta says that overall Native communities have the highest rate of socioeconomic distress. <clears throat> and this, the, this is how the trauma has manifested itself in our communities today. It's, we're not just unlucky people. We're not, you know, this isn't just happenstance. There's nothing wrong with us. It is because we were targeted for destruction. And the, the genocide, um, and I want to introduce a word here that um, is a, epistemology is the way the ways of knowing and being, how we are. And there's a scholar that Rebecca has, has um, <coughs> quoted, Dr. Sousa Santos. She's a South American scholar. And she was the first one, to, one of the first ones to introduce this concept of epistemicide in, into the literature. So epistemicide is a form of genocide because it's, it's destruction of those ways of being and knowing. And um, most notably in our languages, as the other speakers talked about. Um, nothing really defines who you are as much as your language does. And our languages, you know, weren't, we didn't lose them. They were, they were suppressed, they were subjugated. It was um, strategic to take our languages from us in that way. Um, so these are the statistics, some statistics of Wabanaki people um, today. I feel so bad that I'm going so fast, but um, this is uh, Zivayag, Dawn at Zivayag, the community that I am from. Mm. 
Um, so what is what does all this mean? You know, why are we doing this? What you know, we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We have a mandate. We're going to see commissioners as a plan. What they're going to do. And we have all the nuts and bolts, right? But really, what we're doing it's a process of decolonization, right? We're unpacking. All, all of this um, legacy of racism, genocide, and colonialism that none of us asked for. We didn't ask for this, but, but it's a reality and it's here. Um, and we all have a role in this process of decolonization. Nobody gets, out, get, gets off <laughs> easy. Um, it's very difficult. Non-native people, and in Maine I say white people because it's, our state is 97% white, um, they have to acknowledge what their ancestors have done to native people. They have to reconcile the guilt that they feel. I mean, that, that guilt really comes up and it can, it can impede the process or it can help move the process along how, however it's dealt with. They have to undo the racism that they have inherited. They have to admit their white privilege and recognize how they benefit from the fact that we were targeted for destruction. Native people, we have to acknowledge how we internalize that racism and that oppression that we've suffered and how we act out these dynamics on each other. Um, there's lateral violence, internalized oppression, the ways in which we are together. Um, it's heartbreaking, really. So this process is really one of taking the issue and the passion that people have for justice from, from here, from the mind to the heart, right? Um, it's a spiritual and emotional process. It requires a real love for people as humans. We really have to tap into our humanity to do this. Um, in Maine, we're challenging the dominant narrative that it's best to leave the past in the past, that Native people and white people can't work together, and that Native people can't uh, take care of their children. Um, it's, it's really a difficult process, but it's not, it's not impossible. Um, we've been doing it. I, I didn't get into the nuts and bolts and logistics of, of the commission itself. Um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them because I know I only had like 20 minutes. So I think I, I think I did 20 minutes. <laughs> you did. So you did. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could we have the speakers up front? Esther, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation and for all the work that you're doing um, for Indigenous children and families and the state of Maine. Um, everybody benefits from this work. Uh, we are uh, going to take a question and answer uh, time right now. We have until 12.30, so we have about... Um, Oh, 20 minutes or so, a little more than 20 minutes, uh, to have some dialogue with the speakers. Um, so uh, it would be uh, my pleasure to call on you, and you can direct your questions to the individual panelists, or you can just make a general uh, question, and then they can determine who would like to answer it. Uh, so the uh, floor is open. Yes. Just identify yourself. Yes, please. And speak up so we can hear the question on the video. Uh, my name is Gaza, and I'm a graduate student in the sociology department at UMass. And I uh, wanted to thank you all for those uh, amazing presentations. Um, really Would you like to stand up? So I think we can hear you better. Thanks. Um, so I guess uh, I, my question, um, it's something that perhaps all of you can speak to, but um, like I was thinking of it uh, during Professor Yanping's uh, presentation because like you really talked about uh, changes in the law a lot and um, uh, Esther you talked about um, there were several things that you brought up that I found like really interesting like, to begin with uh, that conversation that you had with your mother about and what she said about um, this notion of rights and how it's kind of like foreign um, so I guess that's kind of what my question is about is like so when you're using the law um, you know, to sort of, as you know, to achieve justice. And when you're using the law, which is like a liberal institution, 
then kind of I I kind of wanted to get at like what are some of like what are what do you miss out on? Um, like in specifically in terms of like indigenous notions of justice, are they like is there any possibility for them to be incorporated in this process of reconciliation? And if there isn't, then what does that mean? Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we're working on as indigenous peoples in Canada in general, and and partly through the TRC as well is the recognition of indigenous laws. You know, maybe when I was doing those questions at the end, you just sort of remind me, I, I could have added another question, what would it be like if indigenous laws were seen on par with Western laws um, in the history of the relationship between Western and indigenous peoples? So um, we haven't been very successful uh, using Canadian law. To, to achieve any of our rights, so I, th I think that's what we do have to turn back to. We have had a number of successes in, in the courts, uh, getting the, the Supreme Court of Canada to recognize indigenous rights and even indigenous titles in some very tel telling judgments that are almost as significant as the Mabo case, but not quite as significant. We haven't got them to turn around doctrine of discovery in Terra Nullius yet, but we have had a case called the Dalgomu case recognizing Aboriginal titles specifically, very explicitly, and nothing happens. Like as my friend Art Manuel that I work with says, nothing changes on the land when Canadian law supposedly recognizes our rights, but nothing changes on the land. So maybe we have to go back to our own laws. Um, <coughs> the What's unique about the TRC process is um, we have five indigenous governments. Um, we have five sovereign nations in the state of Maine that are entering into this. Uh, one of the things in the mandate, when we were writing the mandate, we were trying to figure out how much we were going to prescribe already for the commission, how much is going to be already written for them to do, and how much they need to be an independent autonomous body. And they needed, you know, to, they're going to need to decide on a decision making process. But one thing that we have held um, sacred is that the convening group is going to be the gatekeeper for how that, that commission acts within these sovereign nations when they come into our indigenous communities. So that is a place where tribal law, tribal custom, um, and the ways of doing things will, will prevail over, over state law or, or any, any other law. Um, <clears throat> the ways in which we're supporting our people through this process all rely on, on tribal law and custom. Um, Christy, would you like to make a remark? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, um, a um, just a general comment about the fact that although I talked about the Mabo decision and it was a really significant judgment in Australia, um, legal decisions are one thing and in fact in Australia we've had the Mabo decision which was very significant. Um, I didn't talk much about our stolen generations but um, one of the things that the National Inquiry had um, uh, recommended as well as an apology, that was the big thing that we got out of it, was financial compensation and for um, there to be a promise, for example, that these things didn't happen again. We've only had, I believe, one case in Australia, despite very well documented evidence, of um, a uh, Aboriginal person being able to demonstrate in the courts that, um, that they were removed. So um, we've had all these other examples where Aboriginal people weren't served very well by the Australian courts. And there's certainly a perspective in Australia that um, even though you may have a legal decision, it's what's actually done with that that's really important. I mentioned the Mabo decision. We've had the Native Title Act as a consequence. Um, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people around the country are very dissatisfied with what the Native Title Act has or hasn't delivered to them. Um, and similarly, the National Apology well, was a terrific moment and celebrated around the world. The federal government said, uh, yes, we'll apologise, but they've said no to lots of other things, including financial compensation. They have said outright we will never countenance that. We'll do some other things that we are quite comfortable with. So um, we, uh, native title was a very significant thing for us to get up. Um, it wasn't about giving people native title rights. It was about recognising that those native title rights actually existed and that 
you know, the legal system was catching up with that, but we've got a very mixed kind of, I guess, um, checkered record in Australia on those things. Um, in the back. Hi there. I'm Laura Lovett. I'm an editor for the journal The History of Childhood and Youth and also a scholar of eugenics. And what was surprising to me, and I think I spoke to Greg a little bit earlier about this, was in this country we have had both a, a, a few apologies and some recourses in terms of, of funding for issues around sterilization. And usually those were often, often cases that were founded by people with disabilities, but there's an overlapping um, population in terms of especially at the boarding schools, often indigenous children who were sterilized. And I know there was a case in Alberta, Canada, that produced a huge settlement and kind of an, an educative component. But it seems to me that there's a kind of multi-track way in which you know one group moving for reconciliation or for um, some recognition doesn't necessarily get included in some of the other projects. So that, for example, the TRC discussion of what happened to children in boarding schools in Canada did not mention sterilization, or at least your, your presentation didn't mention this one component where there has been some recourse. And I'm wondering, and I know that Vermont as well has made some reconciliation. I don't know if Maine um, has, but I wonder if there's some way in which these issues, I know also in um, in Australia, sterilization is very much a part of the sort of issue of controlling children in these instances. But sometimes this topic is so difficult. Um, and I'm wondering if that's one of the tracks in terms of the push either for um, recognition and remuneration. Uh, who would like to take, take on the question? Well, um, there was sterilizations in residential schools. I didn't mention it, but we hear we are hearing it from survivors, and it's another support for our argument of genocide because it's mentioned in Article Two, I think it's Two C of the UN UNGC that genocide, um, sterilization of children is another act of genocide. But, uh, we, but we already, I mean, what what it says in in the Genocide Convention is, is if you commit any of these any even one of these five acts of genocide, it constitutes genocide. And 2E was clearly forcibly, I mean, removing children from a group and putting them into another group. But yes, sterilization did occur in to children in residential schools. Esther? Um, <coughs> all, all I would like to say is that once the commission is seated and they and folks start telling their stories and maybe that will come out as a theme and, and maybe there will be some recommendations for reparations from that but it's too soon to tell mm -hmm. Christy um, I'm actually not aware of specific examples of sterilization having been carried out against um, kids uh, particularly girls that were removed um, but I certainly know that um, we have generations, so there are women who were removed from their families and then they had their children removed from them. So there was this kind of successive you know, um, practice happening. Um, essentially, our kids, the kids that were removed from our communities were half-caste kids and they were removed because there was this belief that um, if you're part white, you can be salvaged. There's a part of you that's worth saving. Um, and um, I mean, the, the variety of circumstances was absolutely massive. Some children went into homes, um, suffered really harrowing kind of circumstances. Other people went, um, were fostered, for example, and all sorts of things kind of went on. But in terms of, um, it was interesting where you'd said um, uh, about the, you know, the first time that people talk about things, they don't talk about the sexual abuse, they talk about, you know, just having been removed. And it's only when you go back. And that certainly was the experience in Australia that. Um, this kind of truth telling was a very gradual process. Mm -hmm. It was like peeling back onion skins and it's still actually happening. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'm Leah Wing and I teach here at UMass in the Lewis Studies Program. Um, and um, I've been working with folks in Northern Ireland and the north of Ireland in that um, post conflict setting and the discussions happening there have been parsing out the the, the dilemma about choosing to combine truth and reconciliation in the same um, conversation or in the same structure. 
Um, and I, I, I think if we look in general at the literature in the field, it seems that there's a dominant paradigm that they belong together. And so if we, if we broadened the conversation and think about the what ifs, um, how, would, how would the attempts to right unrightable wrongs occur? Um, I know that you're working within the constraints of um, particular scenarios that you're, you're living with or living under, but um, if you had choices, broader choices about righting these unrightable wrongs, would the focus be on reconciliation? What, what would the focus be on? I guess I would, I would Uh, probably all manner of things. I, I, I think I said in my talk that I, I don't believe that you can separate the two. Um, sorry, it's impossible for me to separate the two. Um, you can't have reconciliation without truth. Um, I would like to think that it's inevitable that with truth comes reconciliation, but I, I think that's probably an optimistic kind of approach to things. Um, I mean, in the in the case of our stolen generations, there were so many, there were um, these raft of things that were recommended, very few of which have eventuated. And a lot of um, Australians have said, we can never make up for what happened to you, so why are you pursuing this issue of financial compensation, for example? And um, there are some people who've said, actually, I don't want financial compensation, it will never help me. But there are other people who say, because I've passed this legacy on to my kids, basically, you know, my kids are traumatised because they've been raised by someone who had this high level of trauma too, and it's compromised the sort of existence that they live now. So, um, it's um, you know, in Australia we believe that there in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities we believe that people need the full raft of you know um, uh, responses. Um, and that people themselves have a right to choose which ones are important to them. Um, I, I will say that as well as the apology, the federal government has done some things, like they've established a healing foundation. Um, at the moment it seems to be generally a kind of a grants making body, um, where it makes uh, funding available to communities to decide how they will heal within their communities. And um, the government has also funded um, link up services, so connecting people with their communities. So. Um, you know, it's a very personal kind of a journey, but um, by and large, we don't believe that, um, you know, we believe that people should have the full suite of responses available to them. Um, when we started developing this process early on, we found out pretty quickly that in Maine, um, the Native people really wanted truth, weren't necessarily too interested in reconciliation, and the white people wanted the reconciliation and really weren't necessarily interested in the truth. So we saw, um, in order to get all of the folks around the table and get these and get people invested in the process, um, we really needed to focus on both. And um, you know, we've had discussions about what does this mean for justice and forgiveness and reparations and and all of those those issues. And um, it and I agree, it, it's really it's really a personal kind of journey. I mean, reparations are separate. From, than from reconciliation. You know, we, none of the, the governments that have signed into our TRC process um, have agreed to give any money even to support the process. They've agreed to give in-kind supports. Well, I mean, the, we don't have any money. The tribes don't have much money. The state of Maine doesn't have much money. So we've been trying to do it with as little burden on them as possible to, to, to get their full um, investment and participation in the process. But I, uh, you know, in thinking about truth commissions around the world and truth and reconciliation commissions, I mean, there, there have been simple just inquiries in, into events. Uh, I really think, I really believe that truth and reconciliation um, go hand in hand. And, it, and, and that what, it, and some, some would say, well, you know, we're trying to reconcile something that has never been Reconciled in the first place, you know. So, so we're reconciled. So that there's all kinds of discussions, and I think if nothing else, it gets those discussions happening, and it gets people starting to think about things like this, and and figure out. I, I remember talking to Isabella Knockwood um, when the apology came down um, from Prime Minister about the Gordon schools, and to some survivors, that apology was their reparation. That's all they wanted, and to some others, it, it's not enough. Um, 
So I believe that they that there's a place for them to go hand in hand. Greg, did you want to respond? Um, yeah. Um, one of the things about truth and reconciliation is it is that truth is inevitable and it's it's possible and it's just destined to come out. Um, reconciliation, I'm I'm not even sure if it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, one of these studies that we commissioned uh, at the Canada uh, TRC uh, analyzes the 60 plus TRCs that have occurred around the world and look that was one of the papers I was overseeing and I can't really see any evidence that any of them led to a meaningful reconciliation um, I think I think what you know reconciliation requires that the attitude and the ideology of the people that committed certain a the abuses uh, of human rights um, change that attitude. That's what it requires. And that's the first step. And, I, and I, looking at the situation in Canada, I can say I'm, I can't really say that the Canadian people have changed their attitude towards Indigenous peoples. So I, and that's what we, where we need to try to get and there's also been some commissions that just call themselves truth commissions, and then maybe yeah. reconciliation is down the road somewhere, right? When, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that is a, a, a good approach. Um, but I mean, it's a very, very difficult question that you ask, and I don't know if it, it's very difficult to answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Professor? Yes. yes. Last, last question. Is the last question? Um, um, but leave me time to say something, because I want to okay. invite people to um, so I'm uh, Sigurd Schmaltzer in the History Department, and I'm also teaching a class that um, parallels this series. And so we've been looking in this class a lot about um, at the role of personal narrative in the truth and reconciliation process, um, and seeing how, in each case, the question of how testimonies are solicited, the structure in which they're, um, uh, you know, how they're structured, how they're made public, how they're excerpted for use in reports. Um, how this has a, um, ramifications for the uh, role that these personal narratives play and whether they are um, empowering for people, whether they um, really make people feel that they um, have been recognized or whether um, they can be constraining, um, whether you know, some people have suggested that they've been kind of compelled to reconcile when what they're looking for is justice. Um, and, um, Greg suggested as well, you know, in the Canadian case that they're, um, you know, that they're not allowed to name names where their um, testimony will be pulled. Um, so I'm just wondering um, whether um, you, know, you can kind of expand on, you know, in, in each case, how this kind of structuring of the personal narrative um, has been considered and um, what people's experiences have been. Have these been um, healing? Have they been frustrating? Um, I know at Esther's case, this is kind of still in the planning um, stage, so I'm wondering how you're you know, thinking about how they will be structured to um, really provide the full potential um, for what you're looking for, looking to get out of these personal matters. Let's see who first. would like to go first. You want to go first? Um, <coughs> within um, our national inquiry into the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their families, um, it was a very... Um, uh, gentle kind of a process. People were invited to take part. Um, I know that there were a couple of rounds. Um, the commissioners, and there were two, there was a non-Aboriginal fellow who was a um, uh, uh, judge, um, Sir Ron Wilson, and also Professor Mick Dodson, who's a very well-known Aboriginal man. And that there were a number of um, uh, people were given kind of repeated opportunities to participate, and it is going back to that you need to go back to people, you need to win their trust. Um, uh, some people didn't want to be identified. Some people insisted on being identified because um, they felt that the more specific they could be about their case, that just telling their story was very, very healing. It was, um, there were people who said, um, telling my story means I can park it there and I can leave it there. That's not the case for everyone that was involved, but certainly um, for some people that was the case. Um, 
it was it wasn't statistics that um, I think moved Australia to a point where we could have the national apology. It was the personal stories of people. Um, you know, when the national apology happened, and you know, there's probably a level of cynicism about it now that you know, what did it actually achieve? You know, we don't have all these other things delivered. Um, but I was there in Parliament House on the day, and um, it was. I mean, I can be, you know, cynical about things, and you know, journalists are meant to be cynical, but um, it was an absolutely remarkable experience for white people as well as Aboriginal people. It was reciprocated. Um, the people out on the lawn outside Parliament House, I think there were equal numbers of black and white Australians. Craig was there as well, and he was, um, he was wearing a shirt. I remember him and his friend were wearing a shirt saying, "Apology accepted." And we've got this. Um, <laughs> photo I think that's actually in this booklet here that um, where people were saying two people were wearing and they're all Aboriginal women sorry sorry thanks thanks um, <laughs> such was this kind of um, it was it was a, a, a massively kind of healing occasion for Australians both black and white but it wasn't without pain to get there there was a lot of opposition Kevin Rudd actually flagged the Prime Minister then Prime Minister flagged beforehand that he was going to issue this apology and there was all kind of you know, um, uh, you know, uh, predictions about, you know, um, we are going to be in court. Um, it's going to be endless. People just want their money, etc. But just, you know, on the day itself, you know, schools around the country tuned in. People literally stopped in the street and watched this happen on television sets. You know, in Harvey Norman, in an electrical store, and you hear these stories later, and um, it was. It was an incredibly healing kind of exercise. It was because we had the specifics of what happened to people, not just the statistics. We had that narrative. Thank you so much to our guest speakers and. Uh